ബ്രഹ്മാനം വിദുതാതി പൂർവം യോ വൈ വേദാംശ പ്രഹിനോതി തസ്മൈ തം ഹദേവം ആത്മബുദ്ധി പ്രകാശം മുമുക്ഷുരുവൈ ശരണമഹം പ്രപദ്യേ This is the verse from the Upanishads called as Svetashvatar Upanishad. The translation is that which projected this universal consciousness called Brahma and who gave the Vedas that's the universal knowledge unto him at the time of creation to that effulgent one i go to seek refuge whose light turns my understanding towards the atman so it's a prayer for one who seeks liberation because we need to seek liberation from bondage to one who is free so the topic today is a freedom bondage so freedom from bondage yeah it's kind of we all know what's bondage and we can assume what freedom is like so we will in today's talk i'll speak about a little of vedanta and a little of yoga and a little of common sense <laughs> yes generally uh, bondages are of two kinds external and internal obviously and uh, we are struggling to overcome these bondages through something called economic freedom social freedom and all these civic freedoms you know this is essential because somewhere as it has been in your declaration of rights the self evident truths of well life liberty and the pursuit of happiness ha yeah, there it is and liberty is central you take off liberty you will not have a life that you would like you will not be able to pursue happiness so liberty has always been a central theme in our long social life yet i remember first time i came to la and then i had heard so much about the freeways you know <laughs> way of the free and i was we were we are driving down the freeways but then the whole of the freeways bound by traffic rules and regulations i said where's the freedom yeah and there's no freedom in every instance our personal freedom is constrained by society social freedom social norms social restrictions there has to be a kind of a compromise between your individuals seeking for happiness people have some strange views of what makes them happy uh and society puts a curb on them no you can't do that you can do this. you cannot do this you can and we kind of saying saying this is this is not a society i wanted yeah a completely free society will self destruct and a completely bound society will also self destruct we've got to find a kind of a middle path and the most important thing is as we know 
at least in America, we have the freedom of speech and freedom of thought. And, you know, that's a tremendous, tremendous gift that you all have. You might not know. When you go to other countries, you will understand. Because totalitarian states that say that they are for the common good, if you see any ideological state, whether secular or religious, they say, yeah, we are all equal, but they tend to be dictatorial, inevitably. So here you have, you promised everybody, yes, you are all equal, yes. And then you have a dictator, but on top. And then after some time, that dictator gets a divine status. <laughs> At the same time, you have a kind of democratic institutions where everyone is equal. Yes, but we know what happens in, even in a democracy. We are yet to find a system that will give every person the, the right to pursue his or her freedom to, ex, to express oneself perfectly and yet at the same time live in a kind of a uh, structure that is not too claustrophobic, you know, kind of. But then again, we have people who are spying on your data and uh -huh. they want your data, this and that, and they want to know where, what you like and what you ate yesterday, <laughs> what you wore last year. You are not important to even to yourself. That is all these things, but to them it's important. <laughs> well, so this civic freedom, you see, what happens is most of the times we find that uh, we are, we have not built a perfect society. We are in the process of building a perfect society. Perfection is a perfectly fitted to meet every individual needs. That is. So we are experimenting. Let's see what, how far we can go. But this central theme of liberty should be there in every kind of endeavor. So much for external freedom. Now, you know, they say that there are two things that are certain in this world, as we all know, death and taxes. <laughs> yeah, that certain. There's, the, uh, nothing can stop anybody from kind of transcending these things. But what about life? In fact, life is a kind of a manifestation of these two forces of bondage and freedom. You feel constrained, you want to tear yourself away. And everything, the joy and sorrow and love and hate and life and death are all but manifestation of these two factors which are dominant in this universe, bondage and freedom. Gravity, gravity is pulling us here and there's something else pulling us out there and we are expanding, we don't know where we are going and yet we are trying to get, get, to, get to clump together. So, along with bondage and freedom, there will always be two other words. Suffering and struggles. Because if you let go, you're finished. If you fight, you need to struggle and you have to suffer. But that is the way to freedom. There's no other way. As the Upanishad, Nanya Pantha, there's no other way. You will have to do this. As long as these two bondage and freedom factors are pulling you, kind of drawing you, drawing your, churning your mind and bodies, there will be suffering, there will be struggles. And that has been human nature. 
which human being is there alive or was alive who says, I never struggled. I never suffered. No, it's impossible. So it is actually in your nature to struggle, to suffer, to come out of these bondages. And then to transit towards that freedom. So we've seen even if the society has become kind of conducive for each and every one. Take for instance, this society is much better than many other societies. But can anybody say that this external freedom that we have is reflected in, in, inside? No. We are suffering from stress and tension and depression and anxiety and suicidal tendencies and opioid addiction and alcoholic addiction. The, the list is long. So once you can have the external and internal kind of both reflecting each other, that will be an ideal individual in an ideal society. Okay? We will struggle for that. And we have been struggling for this. I'll place before you some of the constraints that every individual has in the internal world. Real freedom starts from here. And if it's there, it's there. Freedom was the goal of every human being. Is the goal of every human being. According to the ancient scheme of, you can say, life. Moksha. One has to attain that in this life. Well, this life. If you don't, you'll get another chance. And another chance. And another chance. And another Keep on. Till you learn, you have learned your lessons. But that cannot be replaced by anything. Why? Because that is your real nature. But it has to go through a kind of a discipline. It's not just license. It has to go through a discipline. Discipline of the first stage was dharma. That is the various do's and the don'ts of religion. Because the more ethical one is, the more free one feels. The more one's mind is clouded with dark thoughts, the more one feels bound. That's the reason why all the religions have inculcated ethics in their doctrines. It is essential. A person who, who's kind of wanton in his behavior and his thoughts feels more bound. So that's the reason why they say the first is dharma. And on the basis of this discipline, it's a discipline of sacrifice, of prayers, of responsibilities. Then we ascend to this next stage called Artha. That's the pursuit of legitimate wealth. Yes, that's important. Because if everybody decides to become a monk or a nun, see what's going to happen. It's going to be disastrous. So, yes, of course, wealth is Lakshmi, they say, goddess of fortune. And she has to be worshipped. But then there is also the external wealth and the internal wealth, like purity and love and compassion and all these beautiful qualities. They are the inner wealth of a person. So one has to struggle to earn money. Yes. Otherwise, what happens? Oh, money is bad. Money is the root of all evil. You know, Holy Mother, uh, she used to, whenever somebody gave her a kind of a, a rupee, a coin or something, she used to make pranams to it. 
And Sri Ramakrishna, what he used to do is, when he was practicing his uh, disciplines for renunciation, he used to take a clod of earth, clay, and a coin, and throw both of them away in the river, saying that it's the same value. It has no value at all. Rupee is earth, and earth is rupee. That's. And then suddenly saying, oh, suppose if Mother Lakshmi gets annoyed with me, he is also very calculating. <laughs> Say, oh, Mother, you, list, uh, you dwell in my heart. <laughs> so that's the idea. And then a pursuit of legitimate enjoyment. Because you see what happens is your body and your senses and your minds are designed to interact with other bodies and minds and the world outside. This is legitimate. You've got to go through this process. And after you've gone through this, then you start kind of seriously thinking about moksha, liberation. It is essential because Humans are goal-driven creatures, see? And we shouldn't, like, you know, keep dwelling in one place for a long time. We are travelers, actually. We've been traveling for millions and millions of years from one level to the other. Why do you want to stop? Why do you want to waste your time? There was one uh, traveler a kind of a tourist who was visiting all these old Sufi mystics. So he goes to one uh, mystic and he sees his room bare, and there's no furniture, there's nothing. He looks at, where's your furniture and where's your kitchen and all that? No? Oh, right. Where's your furniture and where's the kitchen? He asks the tourist, oh, I'm a kind of a traveler. I don't carry my furniture and my all the utensils around. Or oh, even I'm a traveler. I don't need my furniture and the utensils and this and that. So we are basically we are travelers. And once you've pinned your goal, this is where I need to reach. Then what happens? All your actions and thoughts kind of fall into place. That's important. Otherwise, What's the goal of life? I don't know. What's life? I don't know. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah. So this has been kind of inculcated in us. You need to travel from this to that. So we are oriented towards kind of goals. Now, where does bondage lie? Now he's saying, where is bondage? Where is bondage? Okay. So, yeah. The Upanishads say, Mana eva karanam bandha moksha. It is the mind, it is in the mind that both bondage and liberation coexist. Actually, they are not two things. They are one thing appearing as two. The averse and the reverse of the same thing. So if you want to seek liberation, you will have to get into that place which binds you. Yes, go down into that depths of your bondage and there you will find your freedom. You will not find it separately. Like there was that Mullah Nasiruddin, kind of old, old jokes. So Mullah Nasruddin was searching for something under a kind of a street lamp. It was dark. And so a passerby is saying, Mullah, what's happened? What are you searching for? So I've dropped a few coins. So both kept on searching. You're sure you dropped it here? No, I actually dropped it there, down there. <laughs> Why are you searching here? Oh, there's light in here. <laughs> so <laughs> it's... If we have to seek for bondage in those depths. At the same time, 
you know uh, swami vivekananda uh, tells a kind of a humorous story uh, there was a new emperor in china and he had kind of said all the political prisoners and everything are kind of freed now they can be let go so so there was one old man who for 50 years he was in prison because of his whatever political affiliation so the guards come and say get get going get out so he's saying where where do you where do you want to send me off you know now you are free we have a new emperor so he comes out and then the sun and the fresh air and everything was so kind of you know annoying to him he was frightened he saying what do i do here you send me back in my cell he saying no no you are free now you can go no no please i'll die out here i can't take so much of freedom send me back down there with that lice and my mice and the dank and the damp and the darkness i live there so that person for 50 years he was used to living in those kind of squalid conditions and he did not appreciate freedom he wanted to go back so we shouldn't be like that we know we need to come out of that dank and darkness and the servitude and the humiliation and everything yes day and night we are kind of humiliated because of a bondage bondage to particular thing a particular person and yet we have to swallow all that thing quietly and saying oh this is love so so it's in the mind that bondage exist as well as freedom well the upanishad further says what then is the secondary cause you know the primary cause is the mind secondary right? saying bandha vishaya sakta so bondage is the attachment of the mind to objects of the senses see what happens is you have a mind that is externalized it goes out it goes towards objects and the dynamics that nobody has really been able to define the dynamic mind with the dynamic objects oh. or we interact with other minds and we get caught in that dynamics and moksha nir vishayam smritam when the mind has become free from attachment to objects it becomes so who has started all this nonsense yeah, one of the upanishads says you see the self existent lord yes it was he who started the whole thing you are not to be blamed don't worry <laughs> he started the whole thing say that paranchikhani what happened was the self existent lord injured the mind and the senses by making them go outwards but a certain person desiring immortality turned the senses inward and beheld that atman there so there has to be an impulse for freedom for immortality you know infinity you know that it's there in the mind also that has to be strengthened so the way is clear yeah the mind externalized will bind you the mind when is taken back inside all the energies are focused towards that idea of freedom and immortality it will free you so this is the plan of nature you can't undo it you can come out of this whole thing 
you can come out of it and people have been coming out of this so you're not the first one or we are not the first ones oh this is it. let's get get to freedom now there has been a path and they have kind of been very specific saying whatever hurts us or gives us pain we pay more attention to it always so pain is in a way a friend when you feel bondage you will pay more attention to it well if you don't feel bondage oh yeah, that's okay i'm fine you see yeah but it's never like that there's no soul that has ever existed which has never felt pain or anguish or misery that has never felt that kind of bondage that is taking the life out of that person in times of stress in times of distress we always feel i would like to get out from this place i would get out from this situation i would like to get out from the circumstances so that is what we need to pay attention to that impulse to come out of the bondage that we are in simple so strengthen that bondage <laughs> yeah before we can proceed i'd like to um, mention something about the free will you know we are all free human beings are all free and we have all free wills there cannot be a bigger delusion than that <laughs> we know how free we are we know how stupid our minds are and we have something called a free will inside no will is free because will swami vivekananda explains is what we know it's always like what we know and what we know is always bound by the laws of time and space and causation so what you know is bound so your will also is bound yeah everything in this world is bound you cannot have anything independent so free will so much for the free will besides certain studies have found that before you can decide on a particular course of action or particular choice your subconscious mind has already decided or done the choice and that arises in the conscious mind saying i want this so it's more subconscious it comes out on the conscious so will is there's no such thing as free will there is something called a will and that will has to be strengthened and strengthened to prayers and meditation and chanting that will becomes extremely strong that is what we would like okay and it is yoga is actually possible for people with a very strong will not a free will and yoga takes the kind of uh stands where it's not will is not just in your mind your whole being has to become a battery of will that's the reason why they have a kind of a rhythmic breathing when we breathe rhythmically all the kind of breath moves in a kind of rhythm and that brings all the nerve currents also in a rhythm and when the, all the nerve currents are in a rhythm and nerves are shown to have polarity electrical impulse electricity so your whole body and mind becomes a battery of will so the will is very powerful don't look at it as kind of free it is still bound but it can be very powerful this is one of the keys to freedom a kind of a stamina a persistence a kind of a 
constantly doing that same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, the will holds on to that thing tenaciously, the means to freedom tenaciously. It will not let go. So, <clears throat> bondage of freedom. So, let's come now. So, bondage, now you've understood, belongs to nature. And we are part of nature. So, everything, we are bound. We are in a kind of a closed system. The scriptures say that there are three types of uh, bondages in nature. One is called the celestial. Celestial is not in the... Not in the not in the heavens and something like that. It's just that things outside of nature, in the sense of the skies. Today we have got a, a gale that is being predicted. No, kind of storms, snow. When it snows, you know, you got to take your kind of warm clothes out. We've kind of uh, helped ourselves along the way. In the sense, how to protect us from external, you can say, bondages. Or even rain, or kind of sun, or lightning might strike you, or a tree might fall down on you. Yes, these are not inconsequential. Something happens to you, and you are bound. Your leg might break while walking down the street. Then, so you are bound. So, first is, Celestial, then this terrestrial, a kind of a, I'm walking down the street, a dog might come and bite me. Uh, I say, what, my, what karma is it? No, no, it's not just karma. These things happen. What are you going to do about it? So the, this is terrestrial, you know, Adi Bhautika. So in every mantra of the, called the Shanti Mantra, we say, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Three times. Why? To ward off those influences, actually. Yeah. If I'm supposed to kind of um, walking down the street and some lightning might hit me, so I say Shanti. Uh, the chances are it might <laughs> miss me. <laughs> so th this, these were just to ward off certain things which are unpredictable and really they are unpredictable we may think oh it's okay. mankind has been struggling against these two types of bondages from the very beginning we built houses now we built skyscrapers and we've got air conditioners we've got heaters we've got clothes we've got the works we're just trying to keep ourselves safe the third adhyatmic that's important and there are few factors I would like to go. What is there within us? Now, what is there within us? Uh, we know we get hungry and we get thirsty also and we get tired. Uh, a person might be a great hero and we see it in these uh, movies, uh, kind of these video games tirelessly keeping on hitting and killing and this and that and shooting and that person doesn't get subjected to fatigue or hunger or thirst yes but then of course that's unreal really we are bound by these hunger and thirst and pain and fatigue everybody undergoes those changes then we have something called, you know, we speak. But most of the times our speech is deceptive. Yeah. We don't call things by its right names or right designations. We can use speech to fool others. We can use speech to arouse a kind of a, a mob. And the babble of a mob is... So, speech is also a source of bondage. Yes. Then we have something called the, the senses, the sensory organs. Like, suppose I tell you to eat uh, pudding. 
and you have one piece of pudding and then your second and then your third and then the fourth and then you say enough i'm tired of this your senses can take only up to a certain limit and you you get disgusted with that which you were first attracted to so our senses are limited our minds are also limited then we have the bondages of beliefs we believe in something like you know i always say there are these flat earthers there's a swami there is saying uh, during breakfast in la of course is there any flat eggs any flat eggs around so you say he's a flat earther <laughs> earth is flat <laughs> we believe in crazy things like there's a big big foot and the loch ness monster and this and that and you know people have seen it yes but i believe i believe that and there are photographs and this and that my god some of our beliefs are ridiculous and we will fight and die for those beliefs whether they are sacred or whether they are secular it does not matter beliefs actually hold on and that's the reason why in the first, in the very beginning in hinduism it removed of all beliefs don't believe your own mind don't even believe your own mind you you depend on what is called karma work exert yourself and then see for yourself through that and then true experience arise so there is no beliefs so belief systems and you know saying people have been told lies for centuries and centuries if you do this you will get this and people have believed that people have died and killed for that beliefs yes these ideological wars that we are finding ourselves in today today's wars are all ideological a result of these beliefs wrong beliefs false beliefs then we have something called memories i am going to pray to i am going to meditate on the divine and then all those old ghosts and goblins and everything emerges out they were they were they weren't there a minute ago but the moment i sit down to meditate all these people come out yeah the memories are the biggest bondages now memories are of two classes one is just memories transient memories that they don't have a hold on you but they kind of enhance you suppose knowledge of kind of a a space craft a dark energy or something like that is not going to bind you but suppose you say oh you see that pudding i like that pudding and that's my pudding there that's memory but that has become now a karma that will hold you so the receptacle the you have a very big receptacle in your subconscious mind so there are two types of impressions memory impressions one is gyana ashay that is knowledge impressions knowledge of the table or chair or this and that will not going to bind you but the moment you say this table or this chair is mine there you are bound then we have something called an intellectual bondage we know how we can deceive people and how people deceive us so only after we have deceived oh my god i was deceived ha there's an intellectual bondage also so so much for the adhyatma that is what are situated in this body we have to get out of this also how do we get out of it so there are two transformations okay 
the first transformation is like yeah because the subconscious mind is a source the primary source of your bondage so all what you have done and said and worked for and believed and thought about everything are kind of impressions in the mind so they are they are in four forms one is they are dormant certain things that you have done are dormant the next class of impressions are they are attenuated once again for <laughs> pradeep pudding <laughs> after eating a pudding a couple of times is okay i'm satisfied with that i don't want anything more you have the impressions of a pudding you're eating a pudding but it's it doesn't kind of bind you and tug you, tug at you so they're kind of uh, you can attenuate it the third class of impressions are that which has become scattered like the impression of a chair is kind of is scattered all over the mind chair associated with sitting with with the in a room in a house at the straight back chair and a soft chair a hard chair you know that one impression kind of has pervaded the whole of the mind the mind works on the principle of networks one impression networks with the other no impression stands isolated never it's always networked and the fourth type is expanded so one thing gets hold of your mind and you just can't let go you tell yourself this is the kind of a stupid thing that i'm doing or thinking but it creates a kind of a loop in your mind you know so over and over and over again it's like that melody in your mind no the kind of a, a worm there it keeps on you try to push it it keeps on more and more and more so these are the expanded now if you say my god this is the yes this is bondage so how do we remove it but there is another factor here minds of different qualities also you know in the declaration of in uh, thomas jefferson this thing uh, self evident you know kind of uh, self evident that all all men are created equal you know all men are created equal and then they have a right to all this thing. so we say we don't we don't believe in this created who created creator uh, as if he has got nothing better to do than create all this kind of what we are created in the god, in god's image then what about hitler and what about stalin and what about all these guys they are also uh, created in uh, god's image it's a frightening thought so we create ourselves suppose you are angry see what happens to you somebody takes a mirror in front of you see this oh that's me an angry me and suppose i'm full of love and then my features and all change and i become more calm we are actually creating ourselves no there's no one who has created us we are creating ourselves we are creating our bondages and we are creating other so there are <coughs> some minds that are extremely restless is called a vikshipta it just cannot stand still cannot be quiet it needs to be doing constantly workaholics you know constantly doing something some or thinking something then there are the, some minds which are as they say stupid you know it's actually mood that's a technical word it's translated as stupid or idiotic there there of course are only thing we are a little better i think that uh, there are some minds like that 
But then these stupid minds are envy. We don't need to go into that. We know how much of stupidity is around. <laughs> then we have something called the mind that's alternately calm and alternately restless. Most of us have this kind of mind. It's now calm and quiet and then suddenly it becomes restless. And, and there are minds then which are extremely concentrated. You take up a particular work or thought or anything and it just gets absorbed in that. Ekagra. And there is another class of minds that is called controlled. Niruddha. The perfect mind. So you said, we say that there is a beautiful mind. There was a movie also that had come, Beautiful Mind. Oh, it was a beautiful mind. That guy had gone crazy and then he became all right and all. Oh, it was a beautiful mind. What's, what is beautiful? <laughs> What's the beauty? The mind is full of all the rubbish and all the trash we've collected all over uh, through all our long journey. So the, the the beautiful mind would be the controlled mind. Why? Because in that mind there is power. And that is the power what you would require to enhance the desire for freedom. And once you have that, it's kind of, it's kind of like an oxyacetylene flame. You, you can say, you adjust a nozzle and the flame comes out and can cut through metal very easily. It's not dissipated. Okay? So, so much for... Uh, but then we say, mm, well, this mind and these levels and this quality and there are... The Bhagavad Gita has got, has enumerated a list of that. I won't go into that. But, but uh, just to, uh, in passing, the mind that's full of sattva guna gets attached to knowledge and happiness. Tatra sattvam sanjayati jnana sangena bharata So here he say sukha sangena badnati jnana sangena So a, a person who has got a luminous mind sattva mind that person gets attached to knowledge and happiness. And the person who has got a kind of a rajasic mind, which has a lot of passions, that person has got that constant thirst, Krishna. And the mind is constantly engaged in working. Jnana sangena jnana, the karma sangena dehinam. It's constantly working, working, working. And the tamasic mind, that's a kind of dull mind. It's always attached to sleep and sloth and lassitude and nothing comes into it other than all wrong things and wrong concepts yeah so up, up from now describing what is the mind and the subconscious mind you see so many things you have again you say where exactly is that where exactly well bondage is in the ego Yes. If you hold the ego and kill it, the whole superstructure of delusion that this mind has created, which the ego has created, will all collapse. You don't have to go individually to every memory and trace or karma or this and that and let's break this. No, no. You will be taken on a wild goose chase. Hold on to one thing, that is your ego. And if you can do that, hold on to that, there you are. Now comes a problem. We've understood it's specifically located in your ego. Now try to find out where exactly is your ego. That is another wild goose chase. <laughs> try searching for it. It's nowhere, and yet it's everywhere. It's like that phantom, phantom of the opera. <laughs> yeah. 
Where exactly is this? Now we have to understand that this ego is what is either bound or free. You see, we'll have to not only you have to transcend the ego. So how do we do it? The ego is, like I said, everywhere, and yet it is nowhere. So where do I keep looking for it? Well, it is the ego that has transformed itself into all these things. Now let me explain my, my ego. Your ego is a part of the collective or the cosmic ego. Okay. In fact, the whole of nature arises from something called the cosmic mind. When we want to understand Indian philosophy and Indian psychology or Indian doctrines, you must understand that this whole solid looking nature, which is actually not solid by the way. We are looking at it as solid, it's not solid at all. You think this is solid? <coughs> you have, yeah, solid liquids, gas and plasma and all, all that. Different states of matter. Oh, don't forget it. This thing is empty inside. It's hollow. There's one proton and one neutron and the electron is somewhere there flying about somewhere. Where is that electron? It's actually empty space. Matter is a myth. So you're saying, how do you know the matter is a myth? Yeah, it's a myth. You can prove mind, you cannot prove matter. You can prove God exists, you cannot prove the world exists. Yes, it becomes very easy. So. The first cosmological, you can say, transformation is Mahat, the cosmic mind. From that cosmic mind arises what? The sense of I, Asmita. Yes. So you'll see that sense of I in every cell of your body, in every bacterial you can say all the colonies there, not every bacteria there. It is there in plants and animals and birds and insects, right down to the bacteria down there. Yes, it's there. You try to kill a bacteria, it will try to run away. Yeah. Oh. It means it has a kind of individuality. You take a cell out of your own body and put it in a pet petri dish, and try to kill it, it will run away. So long it was here with you, it was fine. It was kind of like an orchestra playing, and everything is okay. So it is from this I that has emerged all matter, all life, and everything, 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 whatever you can imagine, whatever you can think of, has all emerged. So how do you kill this I? Well, it's not possible. So the first thing that you do is try to m expand your sense of I. Try to become more and more unselfish. Try to become more and more loving. It is love that really takes you out of your gen just your genetic system here and keeps on spreading you out. You see, there are two factors. Love takes you out of your individual bondage and knowledge. If you have these two, keep, let it keep on growing and growing and growing and then you will feel your bondage is disappearing. So what happened to this little eye? This little eye expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding. That is one way that has been given. So when we talk about the transition from bondage to liberation, there are these stages of knowledge. The first thing what will happen is, 
Oh, before I can go into that, the other is, the one is keep on spreading your feeling of I. And as you keep on expanding and expanding, you will feel this whole world is mine. No longer will you feel bound. When you see this whole world is me, or this whole world belongs to me. Swami Vivekananda, when he used to walk down New York streets, people used to look at him. And you know what they used to notice in him? This person, when he walks, he walks like a prince. Yeah, that is it. But this world belongs to me. Wherever he used to look, like I'm looking at this building, this building belongs to me. The trees belong to me, the sky belongs to me, the earth belongs to me. His eye had expanded. There was no more bondage for him. So one is expand the eye, the other is transcend it. Yeah. And how do you transcend it? Through yoga. Okay. So as you keep on transcending, we, we are talking about subconscious mind. And obviously the conscious mind. You know? There is an area in the mind which is called a super mind. You know, philosophers have got, uh, like Nietzsche speaks about man and superman and all this. We all have these archetypes of superman. We have this idea of freedom embedded in these archetypes. Where do they emerge from? It's everywhere in all the old myths of the gods are nothing but the modern myths of Superman and Batman and there's something called a Ratman, Catman, whatever. <laughs> oh yes. Oh yes, Spider-Man, of course. How can we forget Spider-Man? <laughs> These archetypes are actually impelling us. There is an element within you that can transcend you from the ordinary to the super. And it is not a myth. It is an actuality. And yoga has found the means to take you step by step by step in those realms where the mind becomes free through knowledge. And as you keep on ascending those levels of the mind, you will feel more and more and more. So what happens is, you've left all that baggage, your old baggage down below. You don't need it anymore. So as you keep on ascending, the first thing that you, that you experience is, I have known what is to be known. There's a kind of a conviction of knowledge. No more I'll be dissatisfied with this or that. I don't know this, I don't know that. Why? Knowledge comes to you in a flash. Like, I look at this mic. Yeah, I know this mic. This is a mic. I look at it, you are looking at it. But when a person who has kind of ascended to the first rungs of that super mind, he or she will, will see the past, the present and future of this mic in a moment. It will flash. It will have all the knowledge instantaneously. You don't need to go to the processes of logic, all these things, nothing. You look at a thing and you'll know. So this is the first step that you take. The second, absence of all pains. There will be no pains. Nothing can give you any pain or misery or suffering, nothing. It's over for you. Well, nice. It's nice to, to be, <laughs> yeah, kind of. But these things are within you. You have, you all have the capacity to attain that. The third is, you'll become more or less omniscient. You'll know the secret of this universe. Why are we born? 
why did we we have we born what is the nature of this universe and what is the purpose and plan of creation you will know then the fourth is of course your subconscious mind that was the source of all the troubles it will be like it will like like you roll down a stone boulder down a hill and the boulder can't walk up again so your subconscious mind itself will kind of roll down and self destruct no longer will you be held under the thraldoms of your subconscious mind and your past it is the year that you become divine yeah hey, me divine yes yes you yes. who told you you are a human being you know vedanta says you are divine you are thinking yourself as a human being that's your that's your error <laughs> so there will be the the perfect freedom year that you experience on the fifth level perfect freedom and now you see what happens is you are experiencing freedom individually you will see my god actually this whole world is free swami vivekananda says the the universe rises from freedom is held in bondage for a while and then moves towards freedom that's the goal of a whole of nature and with that cosmic eye it has been kind of leading us towards that you know it has been evolving us through these millions and millions and millions of years taking us to that goal of freedom everything hindu philosophy says will attain freedom either this life or the next or you get a chance over and over again but you and me and the birds the plants and animals and everything will attain freedom no one is left out so what about this person of that race or that denomination nothing everyone is going to attain that freedom and then we have that person then becomes established in the divinity becomes established in the atman then so the whole of nature is bound but it is traveling from point a bondage to point b freedom yes the whole thing it's bound right now there's only one element which is free in this and that is that consciousness consciousness is free and that's the reason why we feel more bound you know consciousness is always self consciousness we can see our own destruction at one point of time i know i am going to die my body i'm going to die we become introspective i know my body will get some disease i'll know i'll get. so this is kind of bound by matter this consciousness and matter is bound there is something called the chit jad granti that knot of consciousness and matter as it were consciousness and matter actually cannot bind itself but it appears to be bound if you remember alexander's gordian knot when he came towards asia minor uh, kind of uh, there is a temple there I forget the name of that whatever so and they said there was a chariot and the reins are tied up in uh, knotted in such a way that many heroes have tried to unravel it and there's a prediction that if anyone does so they will be the emperor of the world so alexander goes and he kind of tries his hand at then he takes a sword out and cuts it simple 
said, that's not fair. Well, it's unraveled now. <laughs> there it was. So we don't need to go and struggle and pull ourselves, break ourselves over it. That's the Gaudian knot you need to, that's a chit jad granthi. That's here. Cut it off. Just one slice and there, you are free. Well, this was all speaking from the standpoint of Vedanta. When you speak from the standpoint of, you can say, a little Dvaita Vedanta, that is a dualistic Vedanta. Well, here you are. Holy Mother says, you know, all the disciples says, Mother has a key to your liberation. Well, you can go now. You know where it is. Your key is there with her. Go and approach her. Say, Mother, free me. And this has been also tried. A millions of souls and they have also found her, succeeded. So the very fact that here you are, if you have that kind of attitude, like, yes, oh Mother, you have created all this nonsense. <laughs> Get me out of this now. And mother will try to dissuade you. you. Take a gingerbread. I don't want a gingerbread. Take a cake. No, I don't want a cake. Well, take a, well, you take a pudding. Uh, then you say, no, 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 no. Then she says, okay, come, come out here. You see, what happens is, uh, when we look at Holy Mother, it appears like kind of oh, village woman, eh? like this. The highest expression of knowledge is called a Brahma Jnana. Okay, knowledge of Brahman. That's the highest experience a person can ever have. But here also there are various grades. Brahma Vid, knower of Brahman. Brahma Vid Variya, the better knower of Brahman. And Brahma Vid Varishta, the best knower of Brahman. You see, Swami Vivekananda and all these direct disciples, they were the best knowers of Brahman. They were free. But yet, when they used to go to the mother, to Holy Mother, they used to tremble. Yes. But why should you tremble? She was greater than the best knowers of Brahman. She had the key to their life. So we are fortunate in a way, we don't tremble when you go to the mother. <laughs> oh, mother, uh, my legs and hands are shaking and all, there's nothing. We are approaching her as the Divine Mother. Ah, Divine Mother. We are a Divine Children. And she will just let us have that knowledge. So, we know what has to be done. If you can't get rid of your ego, can't expand your ego like what it really is, or you can transcend your ego, well, you've got another third path. This is the easiest path to liberation in this age. Yes. Take it and be free. Om Shanti 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 Hi Hari Hi Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rapanamastu Yeah, I could ask uh, or ask for you maybe to uh, say something more about the thing you you talked about um, the subconscious will self-destruct I thought that was pretty amazing Yes. And the stone will roll down and doesn't have to be rolled up again by Sisyphus. So. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Because as long as the mind was in bondage, it was kind of operative. It doesn't operate in freedom. Because you have transcended that mind, the subconscious mind. Sri Ramakrishna, uh, in the philosophy of yoga, they call it the 
burnt seed state dagda beej these impressions uh, like seeds that you had you know thrown down in those in the ground certain karma was supposed to fructify at a certain point of time and that's why it's considered a seed with the rise of knowledge all seeds are burnt shri ram krishna gives another illustration suppose you have a rope a coil of rope and you've burnt it what happens is if the rope is thick enough that ashes will kind of retain that form in the coil it's burnt but kind of it retains that you blow hard on the ashes and they disperse so similarly a person who has attained that state of liberation called a jivan mukti the free while living you know uh, martin luther uh, king junior says free at last free at last thank god jesus and free at last and like that uh, a jivan mukta would not like such a kind of freedom if you want freedom you're going to experience it now whilst living that person has a semblance of a subconscious mind that is as if that person is operating in this body so that's the reason why it's called a burnt stage you know, you know where all your old karma is all burnt you have now nothing to do with it finished it's all over for you so that's why he's saying the other philosophies of yoga give a kind of it's a, a stone rolls down the hill down in the valley and never to come up again so this subconscious mind it's all over for you Maharaj, thank you for the beautiful talk. My question is that... Keep it simple. Don't, don't make any difficult questions. <laughs> you always give them difficult questions. I'm a difficult person. Yeah! <laughs> That's a... <laughs> Maharaj, the point is that here, you just want happiness, you just want freedom, or you want self-realization. And the paths you are telling me, they're different. You're talking about bhakti, you're talking about gana yoga you're talking about karma yoga you're talking about also uh, uh dhyan bhakti gana and karma yeah yes so you the, see there's a different ways you are explaining it i think it's the same thing it's not something magical that you'll see the future 1000 years from now it's the understanding it here and now while i'm you know, you, you say, there you've simplified it for me yeah. you ask a question and you answer answer it also <laughs> see uh, swami vivekananda is one of his those brilliant talks he had given in new york on karma yoga so there he kind of makes it very clear the goal of mankind is knowledge not pleasure pleasure and pain come to an end this pleasure seeking principle has well nigh destroyed human creativity and human sensibility you never seek happiness seek knowledge seek yoga that is what is a person you know you know shri ram krishna is say maner hoos who is a person one who is aware of himself or herself as a dignified human being how can i run after these pleasures pleasures that you have finished up actually in your previous stages they say there's a sanskrit couplet that ahar nidra bhaya maitanam ahar is food food fear sleep slaughter and sex they are common to human beings and animals the same there's no difference 
But what distinguishes us is knowledge, jnanam. Jnanam tu tat adhiko vishesha. It is knowledge that distinguishes us from other animals. These animal propensities are there. We have been carrying it around. You better give this up. And seek knowledge, seek light. So, like I mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita, the person of sattva qualities, what is that person? That person also is bound by nature. Sukha sange na badnati jnana sange na. That person is bound by his pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of happiness. Knowledge gives you happiness. Sensory knowledge will always give you a reaction of pain. So you have the pleasure principle, you have the pain principle also together. Swami Vivekananda in the Thousand, Thousand Island Park, he said, uh, well, pleasure appears in front of us wearing a crown of thorns. So, so our, the goal of human life is to pursue knowledge. And that's what actually distinguishes us. And as a species, we have been remarkable in this last one and a half centuries. We have, you know, gone, I don't know, sometimes you wonder, we have taken rapid steps into understanding ourselves and this universe. Never in the history of humanity has so much of knowledge been developed as this this time. Yeah. We should in a way be proud for that. Yeah. And also use that knowledge to raise ourselves. So Pranam Maharaj, uh, in your lecture you mentioned about intellectual bondage. If you could kindly speak about that and also how does a knowledge seeker not fall prey to it? Thank you. Yeah, you can, you know, uh, the intellectual, you know, you know, these very smart, you can say hackers and, you know, bank robbers and all that, they are very intelligent. Nowadays, thieves are all intelligent. You, have you ever found a stupid uh, thief? Well, it's still difficult. He, get, he or she gets caught quickly. Well, uh, some, some time ago, they say, one person kind of robs a bank and uh, puts it on a Facebook. It flashes that money and this and that. And he gets caught. So, so the intellect which is which goes towards material things, binds. And that intellect, which goes towards spiritual thing, liberates. Sri Ramakrishna gives an example of a crow, very intelligent. But see what it eats. Yeah, yeah garbage and trash and all that. So, you must be intelligent, yeah, but don't be like that crow. Okay. So, uh, Swami Vivekananda also gives the example of a bee like a bee. It takes the, it goes to flowers and takes the best and produces honey. While a fly will go to a flower and it will go to filth and it will go to everything like that. So, the intellect also is sometimes like that. Okay? So, purify the intellect. So, the more you search for knowledge, for spiritual verities, that intellect becomes, you can say, free. Otherwise, you're bound. In fact, intellectual bondage is a bigger bondage. You read a book and you, and, and, and while you're reading, you're gripped by that. That person is talking nonsense. <laughs> and later on, you find, oof. Why did I read this kind of? Why did I waste my time? Ah, there it is. It's okay. I would like to clarify a little bit about true knowledge and no ego and giving an example of practical human life. 
He who earned enormous wealth, but he wanted to be true happy, that's why he went to Sudan to help the poor people. And he became egoless, and he was about to die. And in Brahma knowledge, we say, this body is useless. It can die. If you are knowledge, ignore that body. He ignored his body. He went to Sudan and tried to rescue. By chance, some other journalists saved his life that he was about to be murdered by those people whom he wanted to help. In that case, people say his act was like an ass, like Gadha, huh? who doesn't know what he's doing, but he wanted to pursue true happiness. He ignored his body, wealth, everything, no ego. Then what is that? He can attain, how he could attain true knowledge and happiness? <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I spoke about that bondage of the beliefs. Yeah. Yes, it's actually there. Helping others is excellent, it's magnanimous. Uh, it is unselfishness that breaks a lot of bondages. But we shouldn't bite of more than what we can chew. And we should go into the right place. If you would have kind of taken that money or whatever, whatever, and used it in a wise way to kind of help those Sudanese people, even from here, it would have helped. See, what happens is, people who are ideologically driven, they are not going to make any difference between a person who comes to help and a person who comes to harm. That person is an outsider. Either you are an outsider, you are an insider. So that person, he may have been unselfish and all that, but he was foolish. So every time Sri Ramakrishna used to say, you be a devotee, don't be a fool. Bhakta hote hove boka nai. Isn't it? So that, that, that is, that is the, the answer. You should be a devotee. You should be, you should be willing to help others. But that help should not hinder others or harm others or harm yourself. Okay? There is there's something called Atmanam Satanam Rakshet. One should protect oneself always. That is it. Charity begins at home. Yeah. So there are so many people here in New York who would like help here. You do that here, with things which are near at hand, that's important. And then after that, if you have still have the energy and the time and the money, then you go to Sudan. So that is, a, you must do things, you know, kind of uh, intelligently also. So. Hello, Swami Ji. Thank you for your fantastic lecture and all of your fantastic lectures. Um, so today you said that all beings are destined for liberation. Yes. And I recall uh, several weeks ago you gave a lecture on nature. Yes. And you, I recall you saying that nature, I believe you said that nature helps us on our path towards enlightenment. Yes, yes. I would greatly appreciate um, if you could comment on these matters in the in relationship to climate change and all of these species that are going extinct oh. currently, do they have liberation? I'm I'm just really scared and um, yeah. I mean, thank you. Yeah, uh, the whole of nature uh, <clears throat> has got two tasks, and she teaches us first gives us experiences and then after we have had our experiences we are liberated okay it's called bhoga and apavarga whole of nature it's like you are here reading a book page after page is turned what happens as every page is turned you get more and more experience or you get more and more knowledge that page which has been turning over and over again, is transforming you in a way. So, after you've, you've 
had your experiences and there is a saying that you've got to experience nature at every level from the mollusk till the highest gods yes all these experiences have to be undergone by every soul yes well in fact sri ram krishna says uh, who becomes there's a last sunday i think there was somebody who wanted to become a monk or something like that yeah i kind of i never told him yeah uh, like right down from the scavenger to a king one who has seen all these experiences only that person can become a monk in the true sense of the term the mind will not get deflected any more okay so nature what it does is tries to liberate us through knowledge by experiences bhoga and apavarga bhoga and apa you see the nature is not insentient in 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 philosophy nature is living if you look around you go to central park or you go everywhere you don't see nature as kind of dead isn't it or maybe people do see it oh, it's dead no nature is kind of alive living and the air we breathe the, the ground we trod and everything we do it's an alive world this whole planet is kind of living you'll find it in water and air and space and everywhere so so nature is not a kind of a mechanistic kind of a you know, thing that is taking us from point to one to point b she is kind of creative and she wants and she is, wants to do things in a hurry actually yes if you don't listen you'll get a slap get going yes and when we are slapped round by nature uh, we know we know it how how it hurts she is just trying to awaken us okay now about this environmental degradation and climate change yes nature will ultimately clean up the mess that we have done but we in the meantime we are going to suffer for it and we are going to have plastics and the chemicals and all the metals in us and it's going to damage our health nature has got plenty of time she is got she is trying to hurry us on and say okay these guys want to stick around here for some time let us stick around let them let them stick around here because ultimately she'll get some bacteria to clean up the plastics you know like she has bought up some a bacteria to clean up the oil spills you know she has her own methods that's why she is living you know one of swami vivekananda's experiences is like a living body and cases a living soul so a living nature is encasing a living over soul the mistake we did all these centuries was that this is supposed to be exploited nature is supposed to be exploited that is a mistake we did because we had idea this is nature's insentient nature is dull and nature is meant for us we never thought that we were meant for nature now the whole thing is shifting boys and girls in schools they are becoming aware and the times person of the year the greta thunberg it's wonderful to see all these things amazing that there is a growing awareness that this kind of exploitative you can say attitude will no longer work we need to cooperate with nature 
We need to work with nature. So we are suffering for our mistakes. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Maybe it's a kind of a retrograde movement for all of us for a while. But she'll clean up the mess. Don't worry. We give her a little time. And in the meantime, we need to cut down on carbon. Yes, we need to do all these things. There is no doubt we are actually cutting at our own development. Yes, the signs are all around. We have passed a tipping point. And what will our children and our grandchildren do? We, we guys will kind of, in a few years, uh, we'll pass away. We'll leave all this mess for our children and grandchildren. And they will keep on cursing us. So fortunately, all these mythologies you know, from different religions, where the nature is worshipped and nature is a great mother, you know, these things are again now reviving. If you see all the mythologies, you're finding people worshipping that nature. Yes. And she must be worshipped, not exploited. So we have, uh, we have some, to take some corrective measures. That's true. But uh, look at it as, like I said, she is not a kind of... When you say that uh, today is... Patrick just sang this song today. Such a wonderful song. I, I would like you to read that song again. Mother is in the waters. Mother is on land. Mother is the sky. Mother is in the songs. Mother is everywhere. It is a great mother. So we have been abusing our mother for these centuries. In fact, our, our ancestors were much better in that way. They understood nature and they participated with nature. As suddenly, for the last 2000 years, we have been kind of on a spree. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, but then uh, there is a kind of a growing awareness and it's global. Everywhere, people. And see, we have to first look at those who are really affected by this climate change. Some islands in the Pacific, they are going to be inundated. What do we do for them? There will be mass migrations. Yes. Because people will leave their established, you can say, uh, dwellings on the river, banks of rivers, on the coast, and move inland. There will be a kind of a chaos. There will be floods and famines and destitution. We don't see that. We only want to see... Let the polar cap let it melt so we can take our ships right across. <laughs> How greedy can we be? That has been acting like a kind of a mirror to deflect all the sunlight. And the moment that mirror disappears, everything is going to be sucked in. That heat is going to be sucked in by the water the tidal currents will change and it will be a disaster for the fish, for the plants, for, the, for human beings. Okay. So we are sitting on a kind of a disaster waiting to happen. And uh, yes, we need, to, we need to do something about that. Nature will keep on doing her work, of course. But if we protect nature, she will help us quickly get over this kind of bondage. Yeah. Uh, hey, Swamiji, thank you very much for your lecture today. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one was about something you mentioned about the love, compassion, and wisdom that actually uh, increases the eye or makes it grow. 
what is the this because we live in an, in the age of narcissism right we teach our kids constantly mm. about how important they are and all this kind of nonsense and they're actually more miserable because of it so there there is a clear distinction between that kind of eye that is growing in all of them this is our dictators and the eye that you're talking about so i was wondering if you could just mention that in addition to that is there a distinction between because the, we also live in an age of knowledge right we have the internet yeah. we have everything and I think about it a little bit differently. I don't think about we need to increase knowledge. I think about we need to increase wisdom. Yeah. And is there a distinction between the two? And can you also talk about that? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the West gave a lot of importance on individuality. Yes, you got to be. And uh, everything was pinned down on the, on the person. There, you develop your individuality and grow and this and that. And you can take everything what you want, but you keep on growing. And uh, that has been the big, you can say, st stumbling block. Then there was a rise of communism that said exactly opposite to what the Western, you can say, civilization was speaking about. Communism also rose in the West as a kind of a reaction. There's too much of individualism. And things were just people were hoarding and pulling around. And so there were some people who were without the basic things in life. So these two forces, it's called pravritti and nivritti in this. It is circling forward, going outside, and circling inwards. All ideas of individuality, all you can say, you can, whatever you want to uh, kind of collect all your resources at, for the individual level, is a kind of you're pulling forces from nature and heaping it here. But there's another counter force always that is breaking things up and pulling it outwards. You know, Richard Dawkins with his uh, first book, I think it was first book, Selfish Gene. The gene is selfish. It has to protect itself. But the gene also is altruistic. If I protect myself and I destroy all others, I am going to get destroyed. The gene knows this exactly. So I will protect my tribe and my clan, my class, I will protect them. So, so here you have an individual who is an individual in a commune, in a collective. Because proper individuality can only be in a community. Some people laid emphasis on individuality, some people like communism or socialism for that matter, laid emphasis on, on the collective on the community, on the commune class. In India, what, what we did was, you know, we were tremendously individualistic, tremendously, but on the spiritual level. You could do whatever you would like. Suppose I would like from tomorrow to stand on my one foot as a form of religious practice. There is nobody who will stop me there's nobody people might say kind of crazy <laughs> yeah but people were led to do they had a freedom to do to experiment in the spiritual level while on the social level we were all socialist all of us suppose a person wants to come out of his class or caste he could not do it alone he or she could not you want to come out, you come out en masse or en masse. You come together. You cannot come out alone. You are trying to escape this thing? No. So you raise yourself. So in the West, what happened was, there, there, you go and kneel in front, kneel together, stand together, pray together, What's this? That's socialism in religion. 
and where you have to enjoyment. No, that's my individuality. That's my rights. <laughs> so, different ideals, you see. And here we have this idea that when, whenever you have a kind of a strong uh, sense of individuality, that sense of individuality is going to fragment and break into a community. So, the sense of, yes, I will kind of grab everything. Then comes communism and tries to bang this. America went all over the globe trying to fight communism. Do you know that? Everywhere. It spent millions and millions of dollars in Vietnam, in Korea, in Cuba, wherever, wherever. And all that years of Cold War. Why? Just to stop communism. And you know what happened? Communism came into the back door here in America. <laughs> well, it's not communism. It's socialism. That's the economic arm of communism. And they gave it a kind of the French intellectuals. Because the Americans cannot think in those terms. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> they gave it a nice kind of called it postmodernism. Do you know that? Yes. So postmodernism has entered into every academic institution. It's in the media. It's everywhere. They are influencing you. So here you are. Was it necessary? Yes, it was necessary. Because the moment you have something which aggrandizes, you pull yourself together, there's some force that will break it and throw you out. So don't worry, both these forces will keep the world alive for us. <laughs> there are some who will be conservatives and some will be liberal. Some want a structure, some don't want a structure. Both are necessary. You see, an individual, when a person, like in Western society, an individual, lay emphasis on individuality. But that individuality has been fed by the collective, that person's name, language, culture, religion, habits, are all reflecting what? The community. Yes. You've heard of, uh, you know, children being abandoned or left out in the wild and animals kind of wolves uh, raising the, that that kind of baby yeah they all over the all over the uh, world we have some stories those babies they keep on growing but they cannot speak <coughs> they cannot speak they kind of you know gurgle and shout uh, some something gibberish comes out they are like animals. They have long hair and nails. They are unwashed and all these things. They kind of reflect those animals which had raised them up. So, just having a body and being born will is not individuality. You will have to get civilized in a society. So it depends on which side you are. If you look at it this side, it's individuality. If you look at this side, oh, it's a community. So, but right now those divisions are kind of, you know, kind of fluid, it's breaking down. And which is necessary. Too much of individuality is not good. Because you might pass by someone who is really hungry or thirsty, who has fallen down, who needs help. Why? Why should you do that? No. And that's the reason why, you know, they're talking about the, the ultra, the super rich. Uh, the mayor in LA, uh, his wife, very enlightened woman I found. Uh, his name is Eric Garcetti. His wife, I forget her name, what, 
Elaine or something like that. She had gotten all the religious leaders, you know, we had gone for the meeting. He's saying, the rich people are sending warning signals that the imbalance is too much between the rich and the poor. There has to be some equitable distribution. Otherwise, you are going to have riots. Yes. There was already one riot, in, I think, in uh, LA and California. Uh, but this imbalance is, uh, uh, you know, society cannot sustain that. One person or two persons get everything, and the rest are left, kind of. There has to be some form of distribution. Otherwise, uh, you're going to have a revolution. You're going to have... I mean, you get everything. Because those people have nothing to lose. I'm a loser. So what? So what? Let's go and kill some ten people. God, what's, what's wrong with that? So we have to build a society <coughs> that is both individualistic as well as socialistic. And you can distribute the resources. Why? Because... We are moving up as a whole. Yes, you must remember. There may be stragglers, but it's our job to bring up all that. When man first set his, you can say, feet on the moon, the whole human race celebrated. It's not just Neil Armstrong who said, I'm the first man and I'm the only man. No, nothing like that. The whole of the human race celebrated. So we as a species should become enlightened and say that, yes, we need to kind of distribute things. You have to. Otherwise, you're going to have all, half of society with disgruntled people. And why you should help others? Because, see, each and every one of us is unique. You won't believe it. I've traveled much and I've seen much. And yet, every time I go to some place and meet some people, I'm Amazed. Each and every individual is unique. There's something, some unique talent, something there. That needs to manifest. Given the circumstances of poverty and destitution, that person does not get a chance to manifest those qualities. So we need to so this is the way that we can, as a species, right? And now, it is, our, it is the whole of nature. That means all the plants and animals and birds and insects now, unfortunately, they depend on all of us. We have come to such a position where their lives hang in the balance and it is our responsibility towards not just the earth and plants and everything. All life now depends on our good sense. Because we are simply, we are in the middle of a mass extinction. We don't realize it. Who is responsible? We. Imagine. Say, oh, that's not my business. No, no, it's you. It's you are responsible. So in this mass, we must be able to salvage some things that we can. See these poor creatures, what did they do? They never harmed us, but they are being exterminated by our greed. Yes. So we have come, thank God, we are becoming aware that this is a crucial time for us as a species, for the earth, to take some corrective steps. Otherwise, uh, we have these uh, young friends here. Mm. Wake up. You also wake, wake others. Other. <laughs> yeah, uh, and th this, is, this is necessary, you know, because what happens is the U.S. Is a, has got a huge land mass. 
population is less. You won't see this effects here so much. You go to countries which are very populous and which have less landmass, then you see the see what exactly is happening there. You'll be shocked. Yeah. So so much for nature and so much for bondage. <laughs> so this is, I think, uh, this should be a religion. We don't need any more churches and rituals and this. Uh, we had enough of that nonsense. I tell you, <laughs> it does. It has taken us down to fanaticism and fighting against each other. This will be here. And this is what, you won't believe it, Swami Vivekananda preached. In, in the underlying structure of all his yogas, and Jnana Yoga, and Karma Yoga, he, he preached this. Go out and serve. Protect and conserve nature and human beings. Yeah. Enough of this ringing the bells and this and that. Oh God, and where, where is that God? We'll take care of this house. So thank you very much. Oh! <laughs>